Today we'll be taking a look at set number 76407, The Shrieking Shack and Whomping Willow. And while we're at it, let's compare it to its 2004 equivalent, the original LEGO Shrieking Shack. Does the old version hold up 18 years later? Let's take a closer look. Set number 76407, The Shrieking Shack in Whomping Willow is a long overdue remake of a pretty iconic location from the Harry Potter films. Like I mentioned, the last time we actually saw this set made in Lego was back in 2004 for the wave that coincided with the release of Prisoner of Azkaban. It's not going to take a lot of detective work here to see that a lot has changed in the design process, and there's just so many new parts available that weren't even being dreamt of back in 2004. For some just raw stuff, statistics. This 2004 set would have had 444 pieces, would have retailed for $49.99. In 2022, that price comes out to something like $80, but if you're wanting to pick up this set even used, it's going to cost about $150, and at least double that if you want a sealed copy. Those 2004 sets are quite pricey to get these days. They're awesome. And there's a reason that 2004 will forever be my favorite wave of Harry Potter sets. The set came with four figures, three of which were exclusive. Harry's a bit of a stretch, he's only got a leg swap, but Peter Pettigrew and Werewolf Lupin are definitely standouts from this set. On the other side is the 2022 version. This one has 777 pieces. Was that an intentional callback to this set's 444? I'd like to think it is. This time around, we have seven minifigures. Four of them are exclusive, Sirius, Peter, Lupin, and Werewolf Lupin. And as always, I think the figures is a good place to start because both sets feature fascinating lineups. The 2004 version of Harry is nothing terribly remarkable. Like I said, he is technically exclusive to the set because of his dark tan pants. Two other sets, the motorized Hogwarts Express and the regular Hogwarts Express, also featured this figure with dark blue legs. The torso design is actually one that was introduced in the 2001-2002 wave of Harry Potter sets. It's just been recolored here and printed on a different color, which is kind of interesting. Fittingly, Sirius Black is also included in this set. I think it's instantly recognizable, but obviously the modern takes of Sirius have been much more well executed. I like the torso print on this figure, I think that is aged actually pretty well, and he is included in one other set, so he is technically the one non-exclusive figure. The next figure is truly fascinating to me, that's Peter Pettigrew. It makes me wonder if there was a recasting or something or a redesign of that character during production of this movie because he looks nothing like Peter Pettigrew turned out in the film. The most interesting part of this figure is the hair that's printed all the way around the top of the head. You don't see that. I don't think we see that at all anymore. The only other instance I can think of off the top of my head of that happening is with the NBA basketball players from the sports line, which were probably being produced around the same time as this. And of course we get Lupin. So Lupin includes both his regular dark orange hair piece, which is just a recolor of Lockhart's from the years previous, and we also get this werewolf head in dark bluish gray to complete his transformation. It's a simple yet effective way of going about that. The werewolf piece was actually introduced with the studios line back in 2002. It was included in old gray in that set. It just slides right over the head, just like that. Only four figures in the original set, and then in the new one, there's quite a few more. We get the rest of the trio in this set, Harry, Ron, and Hermione, all of which are nothing too noteworthy as they've all been seen before. Harry and Hermione came in the hospital wing set, and then Ron showed up in the Hagrid's Hut Buckbeak Rescue set a few years earlier. I would forgive you for thinking that this Sirius is not exclusive. We've seen many other variants just like him in the past. Starting out with Expecto Patronum released a few years ago. This version features actually even a slightly different torso print. At first I thought they had just omitted the printed legs, but they did do this the courtesy of changing up that print, which was really nice. Not getting printed legs on this one is a bit of a bummer, as the one that comes with Sirius Black's escape in the same wave does feature, again, a very similar looking character, but ever so slightly different, and he does have leg printing. Of all the Azkaban garbed Sirius Black figures released in the reboot of Harry Potter, this is probably the weakest, just because he doesn't have leg printing like the others. Peter Pettigrew, on the other hand, does have leg printing. He's also very similar to iterations of him we've seen in the past, especially the Graveyard Duel version, who also has printed legs, but everything is changed up on this guy again. 
Peter even features a new face print in this version, which is fantastic. And that leaves our two versions of Lupin. Lupin is a very underrepresented character when it comes to the Harry Potter reboot. Prior to this year, he was only included in the rebooted Hogwarts Express set. So it's good to finally get some more variants of him. And this one is pretty good featuring his very patchwork suit. Both sides of the face print on this figure are unique from the original Hogwarts Express set. I'm curious to see what the brand new Hogwarts Express set features for face printing on him. And then there's probably the biggest highlight figure of this set, and that's Werewolf Lupin, who, compared to the other version you saw, is incredible. I have nothing against the 2004, and it served me very well for a long, long time, but this is on another level. We get those really specialized, fantasy legs that I think were introduced first in the collectible minifigure series. It really captures that spindly legged look that you get in the film very well, better than the standard minifigure legs, of course. I should mention too that in both sets we get versions of the Grimm and Scabbers. In the 2004 version, it's just a dark gray dog. And very interestingly, we get a standing rat, which only came in three other sets in this color. Of course, we get updated versions of them in the new set. The Grimm here is fantastic, finally being featured in black, which I think is far more appropriate than dark gray. And then Scabbers is the familiar new rat mold we've seen many times before. It does not have the bald patch like the collectible minifigure series version did. The only other random bonus item here that I should talk about is that the new set comes with four wizard cards. And disappointingly, I got two McGonagall's. Hopefully you have better luck than that. So obviously both Shrieking Shack builds here are not just the Shrieking Shack. Each come with some side builds and they've chosen very different items. In the 2004 version, it was actually Honeydukes. Uh, which is fitting given the location is roughly the same. And then this thing, which we'll take a look at in a second. And then on the 2022 version, we get the Whomping Willow as the name would suggest. And we also get this fence. So it took me a while to figure out what they were trying to represent with this, but this is actually where the snowball fight scene takes place in Prisoner of Azkaban. So those are the side builds. 2004, Honey Tukes does a lot to balance out this really dark set with all these vibrant colors, especially on the inside where you get all sorts of candy and fruit and wonderful things. This portion of the build is packed with so many rare parts, a lot of which are actually exclusive to the set. Note the beautiful printed lollipops on the front here. The windows are only included in one other set that's quality Quidditch supplies. In the back, we get plenty of other rare items, including the printed chocolate bar, which shows up in a number of sets from this wave back in 2004, the cash register, an exclusive fudgesicle. I can't believe they haven't made that since. Even the pink lollipop is relatively rare, only coming in two other sets. I think one of them is actually, I actually have a sealed copy of one of the other sets. Uh, Bears on the Beach is one of the only other sets to include that pink lollipop, uh, go figure. One of the greatest features of this tiny little side build is that they've actually included the trap door under Honey Dukes that allows Harry to sneak in. That's a great little attention to detail that if I'm not mistaken, the new Honey Dukes didn't have. Overall, this is a great side build. There's really no characters to inhabit it. Every time Harry is here, he's under the invisibility cloak. Lupin, Peter, and Sirius usually aren't hanging out here either. It's a little bit of an awkward inclusion in that sense, but I still love it, and I especially love all the rare parts that are included with it. That's pretty fantastic. Believe it or not, the other side build might be even more interesting. That's this box, which is primarily one single piece. This is the Transformer. I can best demonstrate it by showing you this. As you can see, there's a rotating door and that's actuated by hitting this massive button on the top. It's spring loaded, so it works pretty smoothly. I mean, it doesn't get more specialized than this. As cool as this is, nothing about it feels Lego. I mean, look at the texturing that's been done on the side. The only reason I know it's Lego is because they got their logo printed right there all over the place. But the idea, of course, is that you would take some transforming character. You'd load one of them up. Sirius is inside of you right now. And then you could transform the Grim. So we'll set this on top, hit the button, and ta-da. Actually, he's still standing up. That's pretty impressive. We got Sirius and we can do the same thing. Okay, Grim did not fare so well, but yeah, that's the idea. As un-Lego-like as it feels, it is undeniably fun. 
and probably more fun than the 2022 version, which is simply just a rotating rock. The idea being that when that moon comes out, you also get your werewolf. This 3x3 round tile actually also glows in the dark. It's a much simpler mechanism than what the previous Shrieking Shack employed, but this is a lot more Lego-like, so you can't win everything. Side builds on this one, the Whomping Willow. At first I thought the Whomping Willow was going to be pretty much identical to the Whomping Willow set released in the first wave of the reboot, and there are a number of similarities here, right? Including the stickers for the base of the tree are the exact same stickers plopped onto the exact same cylinder bricks that that original set used. However, you obviously get this extreme angle here, and this rotating function is pretty great. Of course, I have to mention the new six-pronged flower stem in dark green. That's wonderful to see. It does stand out a little bit in this wintry scene, but obviously when everyone goes to the Shrieking Shack, it is no longer winter, but I'm glad they stuck with the wintry theme because, I mean, in the case of both sets, it really looks good. Then we have the Shrieking Shacks. They are remarkably similar in size, holy cow. The chimney is two plates shorter, but I believe that the roof is about two plates taller. I think both do a pretty good job of replicating the really wacky look of the building. Even the old one makes use of tons of slope pieces to get a very irregular shaped building, which I greatly appreciate. When you think of the older Harry Potter sets, a lot of things like this come to mind, which is really just the designers having a heyday with no regard for what the movie looks like. But the 2004 wave was quite different. There's a lot of locations replicated quite accurately, and the Shrieking Shack is no exception. The designers did their research in 2004, and they're they're definitely still doing their research today. I mean, the modern version's exterior is exquisite. The angles that have been achieved here, the natural layering of the snow, the work that went into making this look as good as it does. I mean, even the chimney is angled and wonky. It's really cool. There's a lot of cool techniques, a lot of different parts used. The mixture of reddish brown and dark brown works very well. Of course, dark brown didn't exist back in 2004, and so there's a bit more dark bluish gray and even some black used, but there's still great attempts to texture using various one by two profile bricks. The whole building too can rotate because it's sat upon a turntable, and we've got some of that early Harry Potter magic all over the set in the form of just funny pieces including a trans neon orange spider. On the inside, we've got a frog, of course, hidden under this table, and that table is topped with two of those magic tiles, a one by one book tile, and then the one by two trans dark blue spell tile. Up top, we got this beautiful chalice in dark trans green, and then a potion of some sort. The 2022 version forgoes all those fun things for more movie accurate things, which I can totally respect. Though they made sure to still include a frog in the chest. This one's a chocolate frog, and they even have a cup in that chest too. I have to imagine that that's some sort of callback to the original, or it could just be Lego designers continue the obsession with frogs almost two decades later. Up top, there's a number of other great details. The inclusion of the piano here is especially fantastic as that is pretty iconic to the scene that it unfolds in this upstairs room. I was surprised to find there was basically no play features featured in this version of the Shrieking Shack, save for this opening side panel, which does make this side look a little weaker than the others, which are beautifully sculpted. But this is supposed to play into the idea that passing under the Whomping Willow grants you access into the Shrieking Shack, how it all connects here, which works pretty well from a storytelling perspective. You can very accurately play out the scenes here. However, this one does have a bit more going for it in terms of play features. You can open the fireplace. While this obviously has no direct connection to the book or the movies, this is very fun to play around with. And then, very interestingly, you can actually collapse the bed, which is something that takes place in the film using Snape, who is not included either of these sets, but pulling on this just drops the bed down uh, as a trapdoor of sorts. Another, I don't even know if I'd call it a play feature, but function of this set is that you can block off the front door so that it can't be opened. You actually have to move this off or out of the way somewhere before you can get the door open. 
super simple, but I, I like the idea that it actually requires some effort to break inside this building. It's hard for me to speak to the build experience of this original 2004 set, as I've had this one since 2004, and I was not building it directly out of the package like LEGO intended when I rebuilt this yesterday. All I can say is that this set comes together a lot faster than the new version due to its 444 piece count compared to the new one's 777. I can speak to the build process of the new one though. I must talk about my biggest frustration with this set, which is stickers. Things were off to a bad start when I got my sticker sheet all bent up and out of shape in the box. This is why I think it's incredibly important that LEGO standardizes the use of some sort of backing on these things, especially in a set that I paid $90 for and that has this many stickers. We're talking over 20 stickers in this set. That's a lot. And yes, that is a lot of stickers. Some of them are great. For instance, these here, these upper windows, I think that's a fantastic use of a sticker. Adding a bit of snow on this looks great too. And even some of the pictures inside work really well. But there's other stickers that felt pretty unnecessary, especially some on the interior. There are some that you have to put inside those panel pieces, which is just a big no-no. It feels like they did this just to spite us. Maybe a window here or something else could have been better. This random one here could have easily been replaced with brick built detail. I have to imagine there's also a printed version of these one by three wood tiles and so having a sticker down those didn't feel great either. And especially when my stickers are already peeling because the sheet was bent out of shape, doesn't make me too happy. Obviously that's not gonna happen to everyone. Hopefully it happens to nobody else except me. But the fact that it's happening at all should be ringing alarm bells on Lego's end. Other than that though, like I said, this set was tremendous fun to build just because of the various techniques used to create this wonky shape. The only part that was repetitive was the Whomping Willow, which was very, very repetitive. A lot of times for things, but there's nothing repetitive about the build that you see here. As far as architectural things go, I think you can't find a less repetitive build. There are no stickers in this set at all. Everything you see here is a print, even all these wood pieces. The wood piece you see here is actually included in one other set, a set we've actually taken a look at on this channel before, and that is Temple of Mount Everest, which included one also to bar a door, much like you see here. So if the one thing you take away from this video is that this one looks better than this one, uh, I probably just wasted a lot of your time. One of the biggest reasons though that I absolutely love the 2004 wave of Harry Potter sets is they f the fun and dare I say, the magic they brought to the theme by un almost unnecessary inclusions of just magical things like a orange spider living under the Shrieking Shack, some magic tiles and a magic frog. The ability to transform your figures in a really fascinating and unique way and a delightfully fun candy shop that pairs rather nicely with one of the darkest scenes in all of Prisoner of Azkaban. Some of that 2004 fun was forsaken for a lot of movie accuracy, which is incredible as a older fan of Harry Potter, but ultimately this set just doesn't feel as nearly as fun as the old one, even if it is absolutely beautiful while it does it. For collectors, both sets are probably a must. It'll probably be a hot minute before we see a Shrieking Shack again, if we ever do. Both bring something very unique to the table, and I appreciate that about them. In some ways, one does not outshine the other. More than likely, you're not looking to buy one or the other. You just wanted to see them side by side. If you are looking to buy one over the other, might I suggest the one that is actually available on the market and not the one that you would have to pay at least $150 for. But yeah, that's my thoughts on these two sets. Which Shrieking Shack do you prefer? Do you like the playability of the 2004 version or do you love the movie accuracy of the 2022 version? Do let me know. That's all I've got for this time. Thank you for watching. Have yourself a great life and I'll catch you next time.